Hello and welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. And this is the podcast where every week we review a randomly chosen pro wrestling TV show. Yes, and that randomly chosen pro wrestling TV show could come from just about anywhere uh, that could be around the world and also just about anywhere as far as technology, streaming services, other platforms. And on this week's podcast, the randomizer chose, I think, a promotion that, at least in my case, was already a favorite of mine. And it's one that has seen its way around season two of this podcast a few times. It's all Japan pro wrestling, but we're going way back into the archives of 1986 so pre most of the guys we've talked about uh at least some of the guys we've talked about on the uh on the previous podcast about this promotion yeah 1986 i know you know in america you're talking uh you're the summer after wrestlemania 2 uh you're you're looking at uh you know this is Starcade. didn't we do a, a Starcade 86 we, podcast we did a Starcade 86 it's in the back catalog of the free feed right now you can go listen to it right after this to find out what was going on in the NWA in 1986 so yeah we're going to go uh, across the pond we took we took all of the internet's pro wrestling that's available to us. We dumped it into the randomizer. We fire it up and it randomly picks a show. And if there was ever a randomly chosen all Japan show, it's this (laughs) July 19th, 1986 show. Uh, I, you know, all Japan this far back, uh, you know, my, my Japanese pro wrestling, if you go back and listen uh, to the, patreon feed Uh, we have a separate feed where uh, we run a bonus show every thursday for our patreon subscribers or apple podcast subscribers we have uh, bonus content there and we did a show for the new japan wcw super show that was my introduction to japanese pro wrestling so this is this is many years before that that was 1992 91 right yeah, ni- March of 1991, the show aired in April of 1991 on pay-per-view here. And yes, you can go back, listen to that and the bonus content, whether it be, as you said, via Patreon or Apple Podcasts, and hear us talk at length about that show and how important it was uh, to our fandom going forward. But here, as you mentioned, All Japan 1986, uh, that predates as well my sort of live real-time Japanese wrestling fandom I was surprised and and somewhat interested when the randomizer pulled this because several months ago I had kind of started to do, and it's been interrupted by other things, but I had started to go back and do a rewatch or a more in-depth watch of all Japan in the early to mid to late eighties. And I had not watched this uh, TV show necessarily. I was going back and watching a lot of the big matches. So I haven't seen this episode of all Japan TV before because there's no big matches on this show. (laughs) Not necessarily, yeah. This was building to other stuff. This was not a a major show in and of itself, but some big names. We'll get into that. But yeah, All Japan 1986, if you've heard some of our podcasts previously, whether it be here or on the bonus content talking about All Japan in the early 90s or the mid-90s, here you don't have Misawa, Kobashi, uh, Tawe, Kawada, the four pillars. Those guys were not... Uh, we're not here, or I guess more appropriately, we're not top guys at this point. They were not at the top of the card. This is clearly in the Tenru, Jumbo Saruta, Ricky Choshu having just made the jump from New Japan uh, a year or two prior to this. Uh, it's that era. It's also firmly ensconced in the era, which I believe I, I think maybe when I was going back and watching those All Japan matches from the mid 80s and I was texting you and saying man like if you ever go back and watch this stuff or if any of this stuff comes up in the randomizer the thing you have to do and it's a hard thing to do but you have to get yourself in the mindset of like okay i'm going to watch this i'm going to be excited to see jumbo saruta and stan hansen and ginichiro tenru and all these guys but i'm not going to focus on the finishes of the matches because if you're watching it through the lens that i think a lot of people in modern wrestling do and understandably so that like the finish 
determines in a lot of ways whether it was worth watching, whether it was good or not, you are going to be very frustrated because here, even on a show that wasn't quite as big or on much bigger shows, a lot of big matches, most big matches would end in a draw or a disqualification or a double disqualification or a count out or a double count out. You did not have guys dropping falls cleanly that often. And that was clearly the case here, uh, sort of as we set the scene for all Japan pro wrestling in 1986. Yeah. I could have used a reminder text prior to watching this show because <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was wondering how you would feel about this as I was watching. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, we'll go, we'll go through the recap here, but yeah, I was, I was frustrated. I, you know, I always, when we watch these shows, we always try to look through the eyes of not a modern fan watching old wrestling, but try to put ourselves in that place in that time comparative to all of the wrestling and what what someone through those eyes would see and that's why you know the the dynamite kid and tiger mask match which we reviewed in the in the patreon feed was so special and so influential because it was so different than everything going on and yeah all japan definitely uh had a different vibe (laughs) if you will to what was going on in the in the united states but yeah, those uh, not having almost any finish on any of these was uh, extremely frustrating. Yeah, it's definitely very different. And a lot of the crowd reactions, you know, it, that we talked about on some of these All Japan or New Japan shows, once we get into the, the 90s and, you know, into even more modern days, when you hear crowds react, they pop huge when wrestlers get back in the ring and beat a 10 count or a 20 count, depending on the promotion. So much of that is still uh, generationally ingrained and certainly was here in very strong detail uh, because people were so used to being excited about a match and then some sort of finish like that happening. And it's not like it would only happen in matches that were building up to big matches. Uh, When I did my sort of 80s All Japan rewatch uh, and as part of that i found a playlist that had all the uh the finals of their big annual tag team tournament which was the biggest event of their year and a lot of those had disqualification finishes in the tournament final <laughs> wow. uh, or count out finishes in the tournament final so it's just a completely different mindset protecting guys to the absolute hilt uh, you know, and eventually for a lot of different reasons that we could get into on, on another podcast at some point about why that ended up breaking and why due to, you know, pressure from other promotions doing clean finishes, then, you know, companies like All Japan felt the need that they had to start doing that as well. But yes, we are not in that mold, in that mode here uh, on the July 19th episode, 1986 of All Japan Pro Wrestling TV. We should note that this was when All Japan still had an hour-long TV as opposed to that half-hour TV show we reviewed with that incredible Kawada and Tawe versus Shinzaki and Hayabusa match. Yes, that is also... From 1997, a, I believe. 1997, in the back catalog right now, available for you. If you're a Japanese wrestling fan, you need to go back and listen to our previous reviews of Japanese wrestling programs, especially... Uh, you know, shows where I don't, I, I'm learning who some of these guys are and I'm into it. And so, yeah. Go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you're not a fan of Japanese wrestling, it's worth going back and listening to as well, because every single one of those shows, those shows that we reviewed, there's at least one, if not several guys that are, you'll be very familiar with as an American wrestling fan. And it's fascinating to hear, uh, hear us talk about. And then if you have access to going back and watching, seeing them, you know, in sort of a fish out of water uh, kind of scenario and see how they either sink or swim, I guess, in uh, in the deep waters of wrestling in Japan. Wow, that was several uh, I don't know, mixing metaphors there. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> well, the show opens in my favorite way with the All Japan theme song. Yes. No and better way to start a show than the All Japan hope- theme song. I hope you're playing that right now as we're talking. I hope that's... Of course I am. I I never (laughs) miss an opportunity to play the All Japan theme song. For my money, it's neck and neck 
with the ECW Hardcore TV theme song, which is hilarious because you could not have two more different pieces of music, as I'm sure you're hearing in your ears right now. Uh, the very sort of pomp and circumstance orchestral uh, jovial tones uh, of a the march, all Japan. If you will. Yes, yes. yes. We're marching to the professional wrestling ring here. And what we have at the open is four guys that when I saw this, I thought, and you confirmed just before we started recording, Jeremy probably doesn't know these guys. And I'm probably going to have to talk a lot about this match. You are correct in your analysis, sir. I had no idea who these guys are. And the commentators did not help me. Usually, when I don't know a guy, they will call them out by name. But there was a lot of conversation going on here between the play-by-play man and uh, guest color commentator, Giant Baba. (laughs) Yes, Giant Baba, who we'll see later at the desk in an awesome awesome yellow and black all japan t-shirt that looks more like it's befitting of the tour de france (laughs) than than pro wrestling i want that shirt uh it has not been reprinted to the best of my knowledge but this opener is for the all asia tag team titles which this won't be a perfect comparison but i guess the best way i could describe it is uh if you're a fan of the nwa or wcw this would sort of be more of like the u.s tag titles and I know that's not a perfect comparison, but you know, I guess that would be the way I describe this. Not the 100% top tag team titles uh, in the promotion of the territory, but it is Takashi Ishikawa and Mighty Inoue, uh, a name that might you know, some of you might be familiar with, taking on Goro Surumi and Ashura Hara. Uh, Goro Surumi would be the one, uh, Jeremy, if you recall, that was wearing the black singlet here. He had very like. 80s American style mullet hair. He is a guy, and he he did not look terrible in this match. He was perfectly fine, but he is a guy that would have looked very much at home as a jobber in mid 80s Jim Crockett promotions. Yeah, and we'll get to Killer Khan later when we talk. Oh, about- <laughs> yeah. Don't spoil that for people. Yeah, we have the actual Killer Khan coming up in just moments. When we the talk about that- jobbers in the mid 80s here. Yeah. The man that nearly bored us to tears just four years prior, <laughs> that All Star Wrestling 1982 uh, WWF program. We'll get to Killer Khan later. But this match, again, for the All Asia Tag Team titles is joined in progress. And. I'll just be frank. The action is not overly exciting here. Uh, As I said, thank goodness it's joined in progress. We do get a cool double team move from the Hara Surumi team. A fireman's carry drop onto the knee of the other tag team partner. Uh, We get a body slam from Hara and a Boston Crab. Uh, I love I love that this Boston Crab attempt is broken up by slaps. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And the one thing we'll learn quickly here is that there was no limit on saves no. in All Japan Pro Wrestling in the mid-80s. There were more saves in each match than there were calls of the Tiger Driver by Joey Styles on Heat Wave 98. Check out our Patreon slash Apple Podcast feed for more details. Yeah, after the, the brief slap fight that ensued after that with the illegal man, then he's back to work, yeah. Yes, and this is where I was really enjoying Goro Surumi channeling Dusty Rhodes on commentary as we had one man clubbering just <laughs> over and over windmilling, uh, windmilling, excuse me, forearms from either arm, uh, more forearms to the back, a camel clutch deep in the corner, but Ishikawa comes in to make the save. I loved that tag team wrestling strategy. It wasn't like he locked in the camel clutch in the middle of the ring. He took him exactly as far into the corner as he could without uh, being in danger of the feet getting on the rope. So that was cool. No, but he knew that this was going to be broken up because every pinfall attempt or submission attempt will be broken up by the illegal man. This made me feel like I was playing No Mercy for N64 (laughs) doing a tag match where no matter how good your team is and no matter if you're playing the weakest team in the game, it will always go at least 20 minutes because it's so hard to get a scenario where you can throw your opponent out to the floor, then do enough damage to the legal guy to get a pin before his partner can come back in and make the save. So that is kind of the scenario we had here. Hara goes for a backdrop. Uh, Inoue kicks him 
as a counter. That is the move of the night by far here on the show. Absolutely is, yeah. Ishikawa gets the tag, comes in, hits a shoulder block, goes for a scorpion death lock, another move that we'll see a lot here on the show. Hara makes the save, and we get more one-man clubbering. Uh, at this point, Ishikawa backdrops uh, Goro Surumi over the top ropes. We are not in NWA rules here. This is not a disqualification. There's no controversy like there would be some five years later between WCW and New Japan and the NWA with Ric Flair and Tatsumi Fujinami at that super show. No, and and so it breaks down into the four-way on the floor, and it looks like someone was hit by a chair, I think, but the camera pulled so far back that it was yeah. really tough to, to see here in, in 1986 standard definition. This reminded me of uh, just the camera shot of that episode of Nitro, uh, I vividly remember because Kevin Nash was on commentary for some reason <laughs> with Eric Bischoff and whoever else was in the booth. And I believe it was Regal and Benoit and Regal got busted open legit and was bleeding like crazy. And they pulled the camera so far back that it felt like you were in the last seat of the last row of the last section of whatever sports arena they were in. That was sort of the, uh, uh, the vibe here. Yeah. I, I've made a note, uh, Mentioned in my notes, I said they they cut away to the uh, to the San Jose Sharks upper deck yes. camera. That's that's yes. that's how far away I felt. Uh, from... This was not the Dallas Stars hard cam <laughs> of pro wrestling. It was absolutely the SAP Center San Jose Sharks, where I will actually when I'm watching Sharks games, I will zoom in my uh, <laughs> my TV screen. I will use it's... that setting so it gets a little closer. The uh, worst camera angle here. in the NHL. Yeah, I definitely would have appreciated a zoom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, off the top rope to get back into the ring with a forearm to the back. Yep, Mighty in a way hits that. Throw, uh, Hara then, though, throws him into the... Uh, or we, or excuse me, we get a, a Irish whip from Hara. Hits a lariat out of the corner, which actually gets a pop. The first pop of the entire show. People are very quiet at this point. Two count. A long two count, yeah. Yes. And then we get an awesome move. Maybe my favorite thing on this show. Surumi uh, hits a bear hug off the ropes and then goes straight from a bear hug position. He holds the bear hug for maybe three or four seconds, if that much, and then hits a beautiful belly-to-belly suplex, goes for a side slam, and again, Takashi Ishikawa with yet another save. Not to be finished with that, though. Surumi then goes to the second rope, hits a Jerry Lawler style fist drop, and another save. Yeah, the that bear hug into the suplex, absolutely impressive. And again, let's look through the eyes of 1986. Yeah. A bear hug was just a bear hug in 1986. Now, what would Gorilla have thought of this? <laughs> yeah, this he would have been impressed because uh, this was the a, grip a heck and of a the throw. throw. Absolutely. And then, uh, yeah, great fist drop and all men, all four men back at it again. Yeah. And this is where particularly in 1986, you're thinking there might be a legitimate finish, but you're thinking more likely we're probably just going to get a count out or something. But instead, this is what ensues. Surumi is throwing more chops, goes for that bear hug again. This time, though, Ishikawa comes from behind, hits the drop kick on Mighty Inoue, his own partner who is in the bear hug knocking him to the man, almost a Fez press style position landing on top of his opponent in a way then hits, which, uh, which was his big move at this time. Uh, the standing somersault sent on, he hits two of them and gets the win to what can be described as polite and mild applause. Uh, <laughs> that is the, the end of this match. We see replays, which we didn't need to see. And again, like this isn't terrible. It's just 1986 no. mid card, all Japan pro wrestling by far the most impressive thing about this match as we go to commercial is the huge, huge trophy presented to the winners for this all Asia tag team title match. I have never seen a trophy this big in my life. No, the, the, the post match more spectacular than anything in the match. Uh, the, the finish was creative with the illegal man, uh, breaking it up by hitting a drop kick to his partner's back to get the advantage. Yeah, that was a uh, uh, that that was creative, but no, it was a, uh, a a nothing match 
but oh, how I long for a pin. Little did I know I took this <laughs> pin for granted. You did. <laughs> as as we, so, we head to the booth where Giant Baba is being interviewed at the, t- at the commentary table. Yes. Uh, and then well this is actually what this even though they don't say it they don't we don't have the fun pro wrestling news sounder this is very similar to that show that we reviewed earlier on in the season for i believe it was 1990 or 1991 all japan where they go to the desk and then they show highlights that one had the black hearts peeking yes. through the curtain this one my instead fa- one of my favorite things we've done on this podcast is the <laughs> yes. black hearts peeking through the curtain <laughs> yes well instead not peeking through the curtain and really he can't hide because he's a big man but we see a very young john tenta we do i Rick- have that noted here i'm like is that john tenta in the crowd Yes. The future earthquake, the future shark, the John future Tenta. guy in that horrible segment with Roddy Piper on that Nitro we reviewed. <laughs> oh, yeah. But J- oh, that's right. <laughs> John, oh, the John. worst segment we've ever reviewed on this. Yes, Ooh. the worst non uh, TNA weekly pay per view segment. Let's Correct. Go, go back to the archives and listen to uh, Monday Nitro, our review of WCW Monday Nitro, to hear us talk about. The worst segment in the that wasn't an NWA TNA segment ever. Uh, John Roddy Tenta Piper, <laughs> as part of Roddy Piper's family in that oh, never-ending horrible. segment. Oh, Here, however, he's ringside in really cool '80s warm-up street clothes, uh, ostensibly being recruited at this point from being a sumo star to uh, becoming a big star in all Japan pro wrestling and in, in wrestling in general. We see a standoff outside of the ring between Ricky Choshu and Killer Khan, who are each holding chairs. We then cut to John Tenta watching a giant Baba match. And then as he leaves, going out through the crowd and signing autographs for the fans. Yeah, we see Baba in the ring with Ted DiBiase. Yes. I'm like, yeah, I, a... I, I, want, to, I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That would be a, a curiosity for sure. And I'm actually, while you're talking, I'm looking up the age of John Tenta at this point because he's one of those guys. Okay, so John Tenta here. In how 1986. Old you, how old do you think John Tenta was in 1986? Oh, I'm asking you, Jeremy. Yes. And I'm asking the listeners of this podcast. So let me think. Uh, he... he, he he looked so young here. And then his run with Hogan was like 91, 92 ish. So uh, he, he couldn't, he was probably 30 then. So maybe he was, was he 24 here? John Tenta had just turned 23 years old. Wow. Three weeks prior to this. He looked, he looked really young. He had, he had significantly more hair than, yes. than you think of. Yeah. It significantly was... less beard, but yes. definitely a lot of John Tenta still. He had not <laughs> yet debuted in pro wrestling at this point. His wow. debut, uh, he actually had uh, just competed, was in the process of competing uh, in a big su- sumo tournament. Uh, it was the top, uh, I believe. Well, he were. He was, uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly here. I apologize. My sumo knowledge is not quite as strong as it should be. But yeah, in July, he uh, he had competed in sumo. He is listed as a champion in January, March, and May. Uh, so he just was leaving sumo at this point, And he would not debut in pro wrestling in all Japan until May 1st of 1987, teaming with Giant Baba to defeat Rusher Kimura and the aforementioned Goro Surumi. So yeah, that's uh we're a ways off from John Tenta making his debut. This was the introduction of him uh to the wrestling fans. Obviously them familiar with him in sumo, but the introduction to the all Japan wrestling fans. The next match has Tenru teaming with Jumbo Saruta, who last time we had an all Japan show was I think the the show where uh, we both fell in love with Jumbo Saruta. Yes. And, and I, to be clear, I had been in love with Jumbo Saruta had. for a long time, but I, I rekindled my love affair with Jumbo, and I think you fully it fully registered with you how great this man was at the little things more than anything and how influential he was for, you know, and still is for decades to come. Yeah, no, that, that match uh, 
made me learn that Jumbo Saruta was one of my favorite wrestlers that I didn't know was one of my favorite wrestlers <laughs> until we started doing this podcast. So The whole point of us doing this podcast <laughs> to begin with. Yeah, and, and so Jumbo Saruta is one of those guys teaming with Tenru here to take on the super strong machine, Jinji Harada. Yes, not Andre the Giant or any of the other men that were the <laughs> machines around the same time period in the WWE. Inspired by uh, as a homage to uh, that gimmick uh, that the machines had from that wrestling challenge show we reviewed. Uh, was influenced by this super strong machine character here. And his partner is Killer Khan. Yeah, Killer Khan. I was not banking on having to (laughs) to watch more Killer Khan here. Not only is it Killer Khan, but first, so what happens is Tenru and Saruto, as you mentioned, get introduced. The awesome revolution music of uh, Jinichiro Tenru God, I love that music. He comes out. There are women in the ring with flowers. They they are ready to present Tenru and Jumbo with the flowers. Also noteworthy here, the referee, Tiger Hitori in All Japan, one of the many wrestlers, along with, again, we mentioned Ricky Choshu and several others. Uh, I guess not a wrestler, uh, Tiger Hitori, a referee, but one of the many people who made the jump from uh, from New Japan to All Japan via the... Uh, quote unquote uh, Japan Wrestling Federation uh, scenario that set up that inner promotional, if you can call it that storyline when Ricky Choshu first came in. So yeah, Tiger Hitori is here and then strong machine, super strong machine comes out. And then we see a man in an all black hood. And I'm wondering, is it the black hearts? (laughs) I thought I had, I got excited for the black hearts as well. Yeah. uh, That was not this quick fashion corner. Uh, for Killer Khan's outfit, uh, so a like complete to the ankles robe, all black, a hood that's not like pointy, but more like comes out and like w- like it was. It looked like if if the playing card suit, you know, like a spade on a playing card suit, if that was a person, <laughs> that's what Killer Khan looked like here and good comp. i thought it might have been the uh the mid 80s to late 80s wrestler the angel of death i expected him to play taps when he took the hood off but no it was uh and said it was killer con yeah and and we've seen killer con he's disappointed us many times throughout uh the, this podcast and different reviews uh would go on to become uh a a jobber in the WWF in the mid to late eighties and uh, was, has been hideously boring. And let's see if maybe this was his time to shine. Let's see if there ever was a time to shine. He's in there with Jumbo Saruta and Tenru. Come on. This is it. Two of the greatest wrestlers of all time. No hyperbole in Saruta and Tenru. And he's with the guy, super strong machine who is perfectly fine. Totally adequate wrestler. Even 10 years later, on that New Japan show, Unmasked is Junji Hirata. We talked about that he's just a you know a solid pro wrestler. Uh, Tenru and Super Strong Machine will start the match. Uh, Machine with some clubbing blows and a choke in the corner. Note that move down a choke as Killer <laughs> Khan looks on menacingly in the corner. And when I say menacingly, it's not even as much uh, like that you watch it. You're worried for his opponents. You're more worried for yourself having to watch him like knowing what's coming. Uh, he also has some weird like baseball style eye black on. Yeah. So yeah, it was all machine early going to work on Tenru and then con tags in and the pace quickly slows down. Yeah. Lots it- of choking by con stomps snooze fest early. Well, it's also, it's one of the things that I note throughout this match is it's such a strange contrast because, uh, you know, obviously uh, Khan in particular, but Khan and Super Strong Machine are very, very slow paced, late 70s, early 80s style heels here. Just punch, kick, choke. None of it's happening very quick. And this is in in an era of all Japan where when Ricky Choshu came in, it pushed up the pace 
considerably uh, for the heavyweights in all Japan. We'll talk about that more in the main event of this show. Uh, but you have throughout this match in the, the few times where Jumbo Saruta and Tenru, who had been there for a long time and there, it's not like they were guys coming with Choshu. That's not what I'm saying, but just in this era of all Japan, they are pushing that pace and killer Khan is not having it at all. No machine comes back in off the top, hits a double ax and a knee lift. And then Tenru with what looked like a shoot backdrop. Oh my God. Wasn't was... sure that machine was going to get over there, but he, he finally did. Well, yeah. And then he made sure machine got over and almost backdropped the man out of the ring. And Super Strong Machine is not a small guy. That was terrifying. At this point, Tenru tags in Chumbo, and then Machine tags in Killer Khan. And so we have Jumbo Saruta, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and an argument can be made uh, convincingly that he is the greatest wrestler of all time. And he is facing off with Killer Khan. What? Khan. Who? Whose match will we get here? Because... It's not going to mix. We're going to get, when they're in the ring together, either a Killer Khan match or a Jumbo Saruta match. Well, Khan starts by choking. Khan's <laughs> offense is bad. When you say starts off by choking, literally, they lock up and he immediately goes into the two-handed choke, chokes him down to the mat, and stomps him. Uh, and then, yeah, we get knees to the stomach, a stomp to the solar plexus. Yeah, Saruta's had enough at this point. He starts laying in some shots, and I'm like, all right, here we go. But then Saruta gets double teamed in the corner. Saruta's able to make the tag, and he and Tenru hit a double punch. Oh, then, I love this. Double then, forearm. They throw him off the ropes. Irish whip hit a double forearm straight out of Terry, uh, Terry Funk and Dory Funk Jr. Again, uh, just showing how influential those two guys were in, you know, in all Japan and Japan in general. Tenru's on offense now for the first time. Drop kick, back elbow, but Khan grabs him from the outside. Double team by Khan and Machine. More choking. Yeah, boot to the face, then a leg drop by Khan. This is the this is as exciting as Khan's offense gets with a leg drop, a two count, and then to the trapezius hold. Khan sucks. He's just yes. squeezing the shoulder. And yeah, this is ugh, oh my. It 70s. was either a choke hold or a nerve hold. It felt more like that 1974 Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. show that broke my brain and my heart and my soul and my spirit more than uh, something I would have expected even here in 1986 in all Japan. Now this is also we this is all. I just want to note this is also where much like in 1982, Killer Khan is screaming every single time he, he does a move. Is yes, yes, he's absolutely screaming, and Saruta keeps trying to come in, and the referee keeps putting him out, allowing more double teaming. So we saw plenty of saves early in the first match. Here, not allowed. Jumbo hit hit the bricks back outside. The double <laughs> We're team supposed to continues. Believe that then all Asia tag team title <laughs> matches have unlimited saves, but this special attraction. Did not, uh, but yeah, as you said, the action continues. There's a lot of chokes here, including what I can only describe. I, I wrote this in my notes in several different ways. And then after I watched the show, I wanted to try to figure out how I wanted to term this. I'm going to call this a stomach choke from Killer Khan. It's not a stomach claw. It's because not a claw. it's both hands. Yes, it is. It's a two-handed stomach claw, uh, a An stomach intestinal squeeze. nerve hold. Yeah, you're <laughs> by Killer Khan, and yeah, this was this was hideous. Uh, come on, Tenru, make the tag. I'm screaming at my television. We need more Saruta here. Well, and we get several. So this stomach choke, this happens multiple times. So he has oh, yeah. it on. Tenru's shoulders are down, by the way, for what appears to be about 30 seconds, but the ref is not counting. Tenru kind of gets half up. He chops out. Khan just knees him in the back, snap mirrors him, and puts him back in the stomach choke. Uh, Tenru, he goes to the eyes, almost makes a tag, but Machine stops him. At this point, it breaks down into a four-way outside. Doesn't last long. We're right back in the ring where Tenru hits a belly-to-back suplex on Khan and makes the tag to Jumbo Saruta 
and the crowd audibly starts to like ooh and yell. Yeah. <laughs> they are fire. They are as fired up as we were to see Jumbo get this tag and get in and get on offense. A jumping knee to the face of Saruta twice. I'm sorry, by Saruta tw- two times. He knocks Machine off the apron. Machine outside grabs a chair. Well, he's outside grabs a chair, but this is incredible. He leaps all in one motion, bounding over the barricade like a junior heavyweight to grab a chair, bounds back over the barricade again like a junior heavyweight, uh, and then hits Jumbo with it as he bou- as Jumbo bounces off the ropes. Khan with a few screaming chops, then tags Machine in. Second rope elbow drop gets a two count. This is where, again, I note, man, New Japan went in strong uh, with uh, the great Okan mimicking Killer Khan here. Because if you're going to, you know, you're, you're like, hey, who, who should we go in strong modeling ourselves after? Not Killer- after Jumbo. Let's, <laughs> let's go with Killer Khan. Killer Khan might as well. Uh, so <laughs> double underhook suplex. By machine on the significantly larger Jumbo Saruta. Yeah. This was the most impressive thing of the match. I wanted to make sure we called out how impressive that suplex was. Well, and this is where the match, I don't want to say kicks into higher gear, but this is where machine shows off a little bit of what he can do. Like you start to see the chasm of talent mm-hmm. and athletic ability between the two tag team partners, uh, Super Strong Machine and Killer Khan here toward the end of the match. Machine misses a clothesline, and Saruta nails a big lariat. Tenru is back in. He hits an insigiri. Jumbo's in. And at this point, Jumbo and Tenru hit a double insigiri. Yes, Jumbo <laughs> Saruta hit that. This was awesome. This was that rounding insigiri, which is one of my favorite things that uh, Tenru did. He would still do it till very late in his career, even just six, seven years ago. Uh, but seeing them each on opposite sides hit that rounding uh uh that rounding into gear very very cool right up there with that double forearm earlier it's a very effective and visually appealing double team maneuver but con in to make the save tenru on the middle rope but con from the apron knocks him off saruta runs across the ring to take out con machine and tenru clothesline each other as tenru's getting up Khan from the outside has a rope or a cable. What it's some sort of wire cable rope again for big audio nightmare listeners. I had a flashback to Dick Togo interfering in evil matches here. That's what this felt like with that, uh, that wire cable choking device. Yeah, he, uh, yeah he's going he to down tied around the neck of Tenru and he ties the other end to the turnbuckle. So he's he's trapped in the corner. They double team on Saruta, including a spike pile driver on the floor. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome on Holy Jumbo cow. on the floor. Meanwhile, uh, Killer Khan is now standing on the top rope, uh, pulling this uh, this device, this cable. Uh, you know, getting more leverage to choke the man out. Francine he's hanging Tenru with this. <laughs> Francine would have approved of this uh, this hanging. This was like her with Pitbull on uh, Pitbull Gary Wolf on that ECW show. Uh, see, this is the only podcast, by the way, where you get comparisons between uh, in ring activities of Killer Khan and Francine of ECW fame. Meanwhile, uh, Machine is hitting Jumbo on the floor with a chair. And what happens here? Tell the people. So. so- <laughs> So he's hanging Tenru, and Khan shoves the ref so he can continue the hanging, and the ref calls for a DQ here. Now, uh, Khan and Super Strong Machine are are celebrating the destruction of their opponents. I don't know if it was the strangling or the ref shove that caused the disqualification. I think it was an accumulation of infractions. <laughs> uh, the referees would try to let things go as much as possible it, to ensure a finish. And then at this point, once there was ref violence, they had had, he had had enough. Yeah. This finish 
uh, felt absolutely nuts uh, based on the the rest of the match. The, yes. uh How this this ended? Spike pile drivers on the floor and a guy getting hung in the corner. So this was uh, quite a finish. Your winners uh, are Saruta and Tenru via disqualification. I can't imagine a more disappointing match to have involving the team of Chumbo Saruta and Tenru. We didn't scratch like, the surface of oh, anything that those two guys could do here. They were on offense for about 8% of this match. Like we described that double forearm off the ropes. We described the double and Zagiri, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, we got the jumping knee and one lariat from Saruta, but nothing. We didn't have the awesome body slams with the great follow through that we've talked about before with Saruta. Uh, just so many things. Tenor didn't even get to hit his cool top rope flying back elbow drop. That got cut off. No mid 80s power bombs from Tenru. <laughs> just nothing. This was, uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago, this was either going to be like a Killer Khan match or a Jumbo Saruta match. This was 100% a Killer Khan match. Ugh. Yeah, not, <laughs> not what we wanted here. But maybe the main event can redeem and save this show the main event six-man tag team match animal hamaguchi ricky choshu and yoshiaki yatsu versus pete roberts (laughs) ted dibiase yes the that million dollar man uh a few years later ted dibiase and the legend one of our favorites on this podcast stan hansen Yes, I was very excited for this match when I saw this was on the lineup after the randomizer uh, pulled this show. Uh, one, because of you know the guys that you mentioned, several of them in particular, and also because in my relatively recent All Japan 80s rewatch of like big matches, I watched several Stan Hansen and Ted DiBiase versus Yoshiaki Yatsu uh, and Ricky Choshu tag team matches. And so I was hyped here to see this ostensibly, you know, this six man tag that was ostensibly building to that. Oh, and I, also I was waiting to hear that you went down a Pete Roberts rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I I did not. <laughs> However, I will say I was very excited to see Animal Hamaguchi here because if you're a modern day New Japan fan and you hear them talk about, for example, Shingo Takagi, and Kevin Kelly will mention that Shingo Takagi prior to uh, even joining Dragon Gate and later Uh, obviously new japan uh trained in animal hamaguchi's gym and there are so many guys that are big stars in japan right now we mentioned evil that's another one of the many many guys that came out of even before they made it to their respective uh promotions dojos the animal hamaguchi gym so it was cool to see him in action here other quick note yoshiaki yatsu has just recently if you're listening in linear fashion come out of retirement and wrestled on a major show, the cyber fight festival. He has a prosthetic leg. Oh my God. He lost his leg. He is wrestling. Now he's had a couple matches and has looked great wrestling with the prosthetic leg. So that was wild to see him here as well. So there's, there's an opportunity for him and Zach Gowan to tag up at some point. <laughs> potentially i don't i don't ever want to hear those two wrestlers names in the same sentence out of your mouth again but but yes that is true uh i will say this brought me immediate joy because power hall ricky choshu's music hit i would make the argument that that's one of the top 10 wrestling themes of all time one of the most recognizable themes it's still to this day when he makes appearances uh, gets a huge reaction so that music hits choshu Yatsu and Animal Hamaguchi come out, then I will let you describe the entrance of Stan Hansen's team because, my God, I forgot how much I loved wild, unhinged Stan Hansen ring entrances. Yeah, so first of all, we're underselling the popularity of Ricky Choshu. Oh, God, yes. (laughs) The people who had not a lot to cheer about on the show that we've seen so far. They, you know, this crowd seemed kind of dead. They were very excited to see these three guys. Oh, uh, yeah. Ch- and Choshu particularly. And if Choshu you want, in particular, yeah. If you want to go back and see just absolutely thermonuclear molten crowd heat, 
go back and watch some of the Choshu Saruta matches and interactions from when Choshu first makes the jump to appearing in all Japan uh, relatively in the recent past from, from this show here that we're reviewing just incredible stuff. And none of the excitement about Choshu being there uh, had worn off clearly by this point in 1986. So you mentioned it. Stan Hansen comes out. Now the, the camera is kind of pulled back. So all, all you see are the people near the entrance and you see Stan Hansen's rope just above everyone's head popping up as he's swinging it around every now and then. And then all of a sudden he charges out of the entranceway, just into the crowd and then back down to the entranceway. It was, it, it was Stan Hansen coming out like a crazy man. And, and I'm here for it, Adam. I love yes. it. Well, literally whipping fans with his bull rope. Again, yes. Japan. He charges into the crowd. And he's you all you see is this this rope pop up above heads and then disappear again. And he's just whipping everybody, just knocking over chairs, knocking over people. Yeah. He's absolutely out of control. It was awesome. The guardrails are non existent, not uh not a barrier at all. And again, the, what would happen is the crowds would crush the wrestlers. They would rush them as they entered uh, uh, the arena and went toward the ring, particularly for big stars during this time period. And so, you know, sometimes you'd have, you know, crowds of the young boys, the trainees trying to keep the fans away. Or in the case of some of these wild foreign heels, they would just do that work themselves by attacking the fans. <laughs> and that is what's, this team led by Stan Hansen, particularly Stan Hansen himself is doing the most noteworthy thing here from a fashion corner. If you've never seen this vintage of Ted DiBiase in uh, appearing in Japan, in all Japan pro wrestling. And we've talked about him by the way, during this time period from mid South uh, on a previous podcast, but here he dresses exactly like Stan Hansen. He's got, the chaps he has the leather vest he has the cowboy hat so if you're not familiar with this version of ted dibiase i would imagine it's a little bit jarring a little bit different from when ted dibiase and virgil were visiting that jeweler to check on the the uh the The build status of the million dollar championship belt no this and and to say he looks like stan hansen is, is is not correct he looks like a guy who is going to a costume party and decided to dress as a cowboy. He uh, he this, looks like the million dollar man Ted DiBiase dressing like a cowboy on his way <laughs> to a Halloween party. Yes, yeah. he's like, you know what? Like, I'm really going all in on this costume here, and it, it, that's exactly what it looks like. The million dollar man with some some uh, cowboy cosplay here, and and, and Stan Hansen very- looks like a real. Like if you saw that, you'd be like that, that, that dude's a cowboy. (laughs) Yeah. He makes like Terry Funk would say that guy looks like a cowboy. Like he he is the most cowboy guy that's ever existed. Uh, He's just massive here. Not, not jacked, not fat, just Stan Hansen, Haas big, who isn't Stan Hansen, Haas big. However, is the third member (laughs) of this team, Pete, Pete (laughs) Roberts, who, Actually ended up, we'll get into it, looking better in the ring than I thought he was going to based on his appearance. But my God, you have never seen a a somewhat pushed wrestler with more of an anti-star look than this guy. No, especially on this team. We'll we'll get through it. Yes. I, I was getting frustrated. I'm like, less Pete, more Ted <laughs> or Stan, please. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> Hanson and Choshu start out. And, yes, that's what we want, by the way. And this is exactly what the people wanted as well, because, like we mentioned, Choshu, nuclear heat popular. And he goes to work, uh, immediately works the arm, tags in Yoshiaki, and Hansen cuts him off right away. DiBiase tags in, and Choshu's back in. He wanted to work with DiBiase. You could say, he's like, get me in there with some DiBiase. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and... He goes to work on on DiBiase. They they end up triple teaming him in the Japanese corner. DiBiase though gets the advantage on Hamaguchi and tags in Pete Roberts. So yes. Well, first we should also mention that the announcers are talking incessantly about a recent Road Warriors versus Ricky Choshu Yoshiaki Yatsu match. The Road Warriors 
uh, had started coming into all Japan around this time period. And while they were, you know, pretty green and certainly not, uh, you wouldn't call them Japanese style wrestlers, whatever you want to believe that is. Uh, they, not surprisingly, because of just they were big, tough, muscular, scary looking Americans. They got they got over huge. They had Paul Ellering with them. So that was all swirling around at the same time period as this. So, so DiBiase had an advantage. Tags in Pete Roberts, and Roberts is quickly overwhelmed and isolated in the Japanese corner. Yes. Joshu then gets in and starts working over his leg, going for the Scorpion Deathlock. I had flashbacks <laughs> to uh, to that jobber tag team uh, that on on one of the uh, uh, the uh, it was that the Mid Atlantic show where uh, one of the jobbers in the jobber tag team was was holding his own against uh, uh, I think it was against. Uh, Black Bart and uh, Outlaw, Ron and Bass. Outlaw Ron Bass, and then he tagged in his partner, who was immediately squashed and lost. And I had that might have I, even been the match with not Bret Hart. Yes, so I I was getting strong those vibes when <laughs> when when Pete Roberts tagged in. It was quickly overwhelmed by uh, uh, by Choshu here. So we should he, also just talk quickly about the size of the American team, in that it was like a growth chart. It was <laughs> biggest was Stan Hansen. Yes. Big was Ted DiBiase and little was Pete Roberts, but they were all dr- dressed exactly the same. So Choshu goes for the Scorpion Deathlock, but Hansen will have none of that, runs in to break it up, and well, then before, Hansen tags himself in. Before he breaks it up, though, he attempts to break it up with his mouth as he yells to the ref, he's in the ropes! This is just like we talked about in previous shows. I think the other one we were talking about was maybe on the Patreon feed, that individual match where it was, is it Stan Hansen teaming with Johnny Smith, I yes, believe? Yes, correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, against Doug Furness and mm-hmm. Dan Crawford. Dan Crawford. Mm-hmm. And that was the one where I accidentally watched a different uh, <laughs> match of those two teams and then had to go back and watch the other one. And it was hilarious. Again, subscribe to the, uh, uh, the paid feed to check that out. Um, but Stan Hansen is a god among men in terms of, well, many, many ways, but in terms of yelling, encouragement, slash threats to his tag team partner from the apron. Yeah, especially with the All Japan crowd as they're, yes. they're quiet and you all you hear is Stan Hansen screaming at his partner, the referees, <laughs> the opponents, anyone who will listen. It's, it's fantastic. So Hansen tags himself in and begins to destroy... Yoshiaki. Yoshiaki is thrown into the front row where DiBiase hits him in the back with a chair. Hansen throws him back into the ring, starts yes, We should over mention, the by the way, he's thrown, Yoshiaki Yatsu is thrown out of the ring. They then take him into the crowd, hit him with chairs as, to, uh, as Stan Hansen is wont to do, and he's, he's uh, gotten Ted DiBiase into doing, and then just throw him back in the ring. What I loved about this was just Obviously, everything Ted or everything San Hansen does is done with aggression, but just the casual nature with which he's doing this implies that this is as regular part of his repertoire as a rear chin lock or a chop. He tags Roberts back in. Roberts puts on a Boston Crab. Hamaguchi makes the save. DiBiase in, and he hits a perfect suplex. Goes for a backdrop, but Yoshiaki counters into a sunset flip. And he's going to make the tag. But Hansen runs into the ring to start beating him down to prevent the tag. (laughs) But he was too close to his corner. He still made the tag, and Choshu is in. Yes, and again, the save, there are are no limits. It is unlimited saves here. Uh, And much like the opener, the all-Asian tag team uh, title match, we're getting... Saves a plenty. Uh, shortly after all of this, Pete gets in. He hits several knee drops. And this is where I note he looks so horrible, but he's actually not, he's not terrible. By the standards of his tag team partners, two all-time greats, he's not good. No. But he's, on his own, he's perfectly fine. But he looks, it's like, to me, there's only one guy in wrestling that is allowed to look like Dory Funk Jr. physically. It's Dory Funk Jr. Yes, please. Here, Pete Roberts is like a skinny Dory Funk Jr. And it's just, you know, it's there's negative charisma here 
He this is the no. only role he could be in as the third guy with two other superstars. Yeah, if we saw Hanson uh he going to work on Choshu, we saw the slam, big elbow drop, and then gets a two count, and that's where we see Roberts wanting a tag, and I'm <laughs> yes. screaming, Get out of here. Do not tag him, but no. Damn it, he tagged in anyway. And it's like in modern New Japan where you're watching like Tanahashi team with a young lion. And Tanahashi's got the guy down. He's about to go up for the high fly flow for, uh, frog splash. And then the young lion is standing on the apron, begging, pleading, and screaming to get the tag. And you can see Tanahashi thinking, well, this is probably going to mean I'm not going to the pay window. But he finally relents, tags the young lion in. And then 30 seconds later, the match is over. Yeah, Roberts thankfully tags out, and we get DiBiase back in. After a backdrop by Choshu, he tags Hamaguchi in. He hits the ropes, but Hanson from the apron grabs him. He's holding him as DiBiase charges in and nails a knee to the chest. Too often, too often, that person moves and the teammates collide. (laughs) I like here that we got to see effective double teaming from the heels. Yes. And again, I feel like a very video game thing when you're playing a tag team match in something like No Mercy and a guy bounces off the ropes. And if you can control the guy in the apron, you, you push that button to get <laughs> the grapple button to grab him before he can actually bounce back off the ropes. That's exactly what happened here. And like you said, cool to see that for once not backfire. Robert's back in and here's the highlight for him in this match. He hits a gut wrench suplex. And then his uppercut is blocked into a backslide attempt, and Choshu is back in. Choshu holds Roberts in a belly-to-back suplex position as Yoshiaki comes off the top with an elbow. This was an impressive double-team move here. Yes, basically a back suplex position, as you said, from Choshu. And then Yoshiaki Yatsu comes off of that flying neckbreaker drop-style clothesline. Imagine that. Uh, that flying clothesline that Randy Savage would do, that off the top while the opponent is held in a back suplex position. Something that absolutely should have been a finish in 1986. 100%. I could buy it as a, I could buy it as a finish right now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Hanson comes in to make a save or break up a pin. And and what I love is when he when he comes in to make the save or break up a pin, he doesn't hit you once and leave. He gets a few shots in, before being put out by the ref. So the yeah. initial shot to break it up, but then just keeps laying them in until the referee f- physically puts them out. I well, love the little things from Stan Hansen. Well, it's all those things. It's what Stan Hansen does that's, you know, again, we talk about wrestlers that young modern wrestlers should study. I mentioned before Jumbo Saruta being one of those guys. Stan Hansen, clearly another one in that everything he does has intent and purpose. He doesn't just make a save by coming in and tapping a guy on the back and that somehow breaks up the pin. He will beat the man until the pin is not happening. He, you know, if he's in a struggle, it looks like a struggle. It doesn't just look like he's going along with everything. Wrestling needs more of that, not less. All right, this was ugly. Choshu is sent in. Roberts goes to backdrop him. But Choshu tries a sunset flip that Roberts appeared unaware to what was going to happen. So it turned into a shoot sunset flip attempt. It was so awkward and weird until Hansen came in to save this by attacking Choshu. Yeah, and they go back to it a couple spots later, which is always a pet peeve of mine. I have that noted here, like, oh, (laughs) no, Adam's going to be mad here. (laughs) The only thing that could be worse is if it was the confluence of two of my biggest pet peeves, if it was a botched (laughs) top rope rope. sunset flip spot that they went back to. But no, this almost turned into a 1986 shoot Canadian destroyer on this botched sunset flip attempt. Thankfully, it didn't. Uh, Pete hits a backbreaker. Stan hits a top rope stop. Stan Hansen does. And then we have Pete and Ricky Choshu repeating the sunset flip counter to the backdrop spot. This time it's, uh, it works. Yoshiaki Yatsu comes in. Uh, he and Choshu hit a double suplex on Pete, but Ted DiBiase comes to make the save, which smart move because I could very easily buy a double suplex putting Pete Roberts out of commission. Yoshiaki has Roberts over his shoulder in a backbreaker submission. And Hansen will have none of that. He comes in, kicks him in his exposed midsection. <laughs> yes. DiBiase in. 
he does his backdrop and that awesome falling fist drop that oh, the Ted best. DiBiase was always known for. One of the best things in the WrestleFest game. Yes. Uh, the classic arcade game, which you and I are very familiar with. Uh, it was the animation of San, San or excuse me, Ted DiBiase hitting that falling fist drop. Nobody else does it that way. You had Jerry Lawler, which would do more of the drop to the knees fist drop. You had uh, Road Warrior Hawk, who do that jumping, jumping version yeah. of the same fist drop. But the Stan Hansen, where he kind of cocks his elbow in like that triangular position, holds his fist out, and then just falls over like a tree in the forest into the fist drop is just, it's beautiful. It's classic Ted DiBiase, and we got to see it here. He then charges in the corner. Yoshiaki catches him with a boot to the face, then to the middle turnbuckle, missed a knee drop. DiBiase looked like he was going to go for a figure four. Uh, It's broken up. Both men are jockeying for position, and DiBiase ends up getting him in an abdominal stretch. Choshu breaks this up by hitting a lariat on DiBiase and this then was, one on Roberts as well. Big Choshu was, lariats. Yes, the Choshu lariat, his by far uh, most prevalent big offensive weapon. Uh, there's a reason that people literally call the style of pro wrestling that Ricky Choshu engaged in lariat pro wrestling. Uh, he hits that with DiBiase as exposed as possible, uh, having that uh, Cobra stretch, the abdominal stretch on very cool spot there. Uh, but Hansen then, yeah. does not get hit <laughs> with the Lariat. Hansen no. boots Choshu to the floor. It breaks down into a six-way. Hansen hits Hamaguchi with a Lariat. And now but they're all, not legal at that point. No, and all six men are on the outside. DiBiase is hitting guys with chairs. Choshu's choking out Hansen. Hansen's whipping it. chairs from the crowd into the ring. It's chaos and pandemonium outside the ring. All You've got us. really all six men are in one pile yes. on the apron, like so, some in the ring, some out. But it's as though there's a magnet that pulled these six men to this specific spot on that side of the ring. As it's just as you said, chaos. It's absolute chaos. And then the bell rings, and I yell, "No, come on!" <laughs> <sighs> and then so back to back matches, no finishes. Hanson's he's throwing things around the ring and absolutely terrifying fashion he yells he screams and he heads to the locker room that was that was a great way to end the show i couldn't have thought of a better way to make me feel better after that finish than scary stan hansen being (laughs) scary and then yelling and screaming off to the locker room yeah so the most offensive part of this match is that you had pete roberts in it and he wasn't there to take the fall (laughs) like well it's just shocking to me we had to protect Pete Roberts here, which is just, again, just indicative of, of the booking style here from Baba and All Japan uh, in the mid-80s. I also don't know why we needed the replays of the <laughs> brawl at the end, reminding us, after we saw the awesome hands and craziness as they leave the ring, reminding us that, yes, that match did, in fact, uh, end in a DQ. Now, the one thing I did want to mention, because we didn't really talk about it as we were going through the uh, the play-by-play of this match, is just going back to what I talked about earlier, the pace that these guys were wrestling at. All these guys, the exception potentially of Pete Roberts, all these guys yes. are big heavyweights, yes. and they are going a mile a minute. And this is the era of All Japan where not everything in the match, and I'm not even just talking about the finish, not everything in the match necessarily made sense or built throughout the match but it was all about pushing the pace and for guys this size for heavyweights to be wrestling at this pace for a good 15 minutes when you compare that to what was going on in the u.s even in in the nwa in the mid 80s it is striking i mean it was move 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 tag guy comes in move move like just constant motion and action, which you wouldn't normally expect from a bunch of heavyweights in the mid-80s. No, and, and Choshu, Yoshiaki, DiBiase, and even Stan Hansen had no problems pushing that oh, no. pace. Like, no, and Yatsu is one of the... He's one of those guys that has been kind of lost to the sands of time because he was in... You know, his prime was pre the Four Pillars era that I talked about earlier with All Japan, and then... Uh, understandably and rightfully so all the air gets sucked up out of the room by uh you know by tenru by saruta 
by Choshu when he comes in. But that was one of my revelations. We don't necessarily see a ton of it here, but on some of the other All Japan stuff that I've watched uh, from this time period in recent months is that Yatsu was damn good. And I was actually hoping we would have seen more out of him here than we got to see. Favorite thing on the show, Adam? Oh, God, I think it's really everything Stan Hansen. It, it, it's just yes, him it whipping fans coming out. It's him yelling from the apron. And you don't know if you're Pete Roberts, whether that's encouragement or that this man is going to kill you when you get to the back, even though he's your partner. It's all things Stan Hansen. That is the correct answer. Uh, what was the worst thing for you on the show and why was it Killer Khan? <laughs> it was Killer Khan. And a why is because it ruined us seeing prime mid 80s Tenru Saruta. Yes, you are correct. Those two yeah. men. All right. Like, we if, you are... told, if you would have told me I wasn't going to enjoy a Tenru Saruta tag match, I would have been, I, I just would not have believed you. Just no. quickly, my honorable mention seeing young 23 year old John Tenta yes. about to begin his pro wrestling journey. Yes, those are all the correct answers. We are 100% in sync on this show and those reviews. Always fun to go uh, deep into the archives for one and uh, and getting this. Anytime we get to see All Japan, it is a treat as well. So if you want to hear us talk about more All Japan, New Japan, and many other shows we've got an entire back catalog of this podcast. These are evergreen shows. You can go fire up new Japan that we reviewed from season one. And it is just as new today as the day that it came out. So go ahead and, and listen to anything in the back catalog. That's free of charge. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is through our Patreon, patreon.com slash wrestling at random. If you subscribe to, in the Patreon, you get a bonus feed where we have additional content every week. So that's two episodes a week. That's right. Bonus content every single Thursday in the bonus feed. You can subscribe again at patreon.com slash wrestling at random. While you're there, if you want to pick yourself up a t-shirt, you can sign up for the $15 feed. That will give you uh, that'll give you the, the bonus feed and a t-shirt. And then when that's done, you just, after one month, you get your t-shirt, you bump yourself down to just the four ninety nine and continue to uh, enjoy the bonus content. If uh, going to Patreon is a hassle for you, you can always, and Apple, Apple Podcasts is your podcatcher, you can hit the subscribe button right there. It'll just bill you monthly right in your iTunes, right in your Apple Podcasts, super easy. That's just a double tap away if you want to subscribe that way as well. So all of that is available. And you can even, if you look at the the, the back catalog of the bonus content, which you would get if you subscribe today, you get hours and hours and hours of content. You will see that some of these shows weren't selected at random because people can pay to be the randomizer on the Patreon feed. You can sign up for the $10 tier and you are, you're able to pick a show for us to watch, pick a match that was important to you or something you, you think we'd enjoy watching or would be funny if we watched. Uh, (laughs) There's a lot of range from what people pick and uh, yeah, definitely go. uh, You can see what people have picked in the past and you can yourself be the randomizer, commission a podcast, executive produce it, and we will watch it for you. Yes. One other thing I want to, a couple actually things I want to mention about the bonus feed. Yes. If you are a fan of what we talked about here, all Japan, you mentioned new Japan as well. There is plenty of that both in the back catalog of the free feed and the uh, bonus feed, but that bonus feed is not just Japanese wrestling. It is by and large, much like the rest of the podcast, wrestling from all around the world, WWF, WCW, ECW, territories, random one-off matches. It's all there. And the other thing we should note, Jeremy, I don't think we've told people this before, but that coming up, you know, at some point in the not terribly distant future, at some point, much like after season one, we will have a season break on the free feed. However, if you are subscribed uh, to the bonus content, whether it be on Patreon, or via Apple Podcasts, that feed will still continue during the free season break with new content. So that's something to keep in mind as well. 
there's never been a better time. You've got, you, you, if you're just subscribing now, you got a lot of content to catch up on in the bonus feed. So hop to it, get to it. Uh, and, and that helps us support the show. And that helps us continue to do this and bring this to you uh, twice a week, every week. And, and so we appreciate all of our listeners and we love to interact with the listeners as well. So we love to hear what you're listening to, your thoughts on the show, memories of the show when, if you watched it live or you were there or you know just just anything you you know share with us your experience with any of these shows the best way to do that is via twitter at wrestle at random also facebook.com slash wrestling at random is another way to interact with the show if you're not on social media uh, then you can also send us an email wrestling at random at gmail.com always to interact with the podcast Absolutely. And normally this is where I would mention about, uh, you know, even if uh, you have a former friend uh, who you know is a wrestling fan, tell them about this podcast. And I would like you to do that still. But quite honestly, I don't have anything clever to say relating that to this episode because I'm still just so angry that we had to watch Killer Khan again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, yeah, but please tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell your coworkers, tell everybody uh, who likes wrestling, liked it before, may, may want to take a trip down memory lane to uh, subscribe uh, to this podcast. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. Unlike All Japan in 1986, this podcast will actually have a finish. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.